I'm here today with Dr. Christian Bush, who is an internationally known expert in the areas of innovation, purpose-driven leadership, and serendipity. He teaches at New York University and the London School of Economics, and he's the director of the CGA Global Economy Programme. Previously, he co-directed the LSE's Innovation Lab and co-founded the Sandbox Network, a global community of young innovators, as well as Leaders on Purpose, an organisation convening purpose-driven CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. He's a member of the World Economic Forum's Expert Forum, a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, among Diplomatic Courier's top 99 influencers, and on the Thinkers 50 radar list of the 30 thinkers most likely to shape the future. And his new book, Connect the Dots, The Art and Science of Creating Good Luck, penned by Penguin, has been described by Ariana Huffington, no less, as a wise, exciting, and life-changing book. So, I mean, what a bio. Welcome to the show, Christian. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to have you here. And I want to talk about um, serendipity. What a great word that is, by the way. And this, you talk about the serendipity mindset. In fact, I think that was the original title of the book, wasn't it? And the international edition is Connect the Dots. So what is a serendipity mindset and how do I get one? Yeah, well, the core idea really is to say, usually when we think about luck, we think about the kind of blind luck that just happens to us, you know, being born into a good family, all the kind of things that we can't really pick that just happen to us. But, but serendipity and, and a serendipity mindset is about creating smart luck. It's about saying, how do I see a little bit more in unexpected moments and turn that into positive unexpected outcomes? So take, you know, the quintessential example. If you have uh, erratic hand movements like I do, you spill a lot of coffee. And so imagine you you spill coffee over someone uh, in, in a coffee shop and, and that person looks at you slightly annoyed, but you sense there might be something there. You don't know what it is. You just sense there might be something there. And now you have two options, right? Option one is you just say, I'm so sorry, here's a napkin. You walk outside and you think, ah, what could have happened had I spoken with that person? And option two is, you know, you start a conversation, that person turns out to become your co-founder, the love of your life, you name it. And so it's our reaction to that unexpected moment. It's our making this accident meaningful that in a way creates that serendipity. And there's so much in there about optimism and a little bit of self-confidence and a little bit of not minding rejection. And all of that can be quite hard for some people, can't it? So serendipity, how, how do you advise somebody whose natural instinct is to run away, <laughs> to, to embrace serendipity a bit more? I'm British, keep this in mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a great question. I mean, I'm a closet introvert. You know, I'm the kind of person... No problem giving a speech in front of you know hundreds of people and then hiding in the in the in the bathroom afterwards because I need to recharge and and regain my energy and so it's it's really you know for for people like me one thing is I think a lot of times serendipity comes from calm and, and quiet sources right it comes from reading a book and thinking oh my god that should be a podcast like connecting the dots out of those unexpected yeah. things we read or we watch in a movie or you know taking another street to work in the morning and seeing something in a bookstore and. And, and coincidentally then coming up with something new. And so I think there's that part. And then on the other side, you know, I'm a big fan of two things. One is very pragmatic, you know, exercises. I'm sure we'll, we'll talk more about this. For example, you know, the hook strategy, that, that is one of my favorites. But then also really diving deeper to your point into what is it that is really holding me back? Is it, mm -hmm. you know, fear of rejection? And if it is fear of rejection, one thing that really helped me, for example, is to say, okay, I always assumed the worst thing in this situation could be rejection, right? So that that person says, I'm so sorry, I don't have time for you at this point. It could be in that coffee shop. It could be, you know, walking up to a speaker at a conference, whatever it is, but it, it is that moment or speaking up in a meeting, right? That kind of where you have that unexpected idea and you hold yourself back because you're like, oh, I'm not ready or I'm not worthy or whatever it is. And the, the thing I realized is, and the thing that I, I reframe for myself is that the worst thing in that moment is not the rejection, right? That stings and that's like, ah, mm, okay. But the worst thing is going outside and thinking, ah, what could have happened? That nagging thought that comes back, ah, what could have happened? What could have happened had I spoken with that person? So I feel that reframing helped me a lot to say, you know what, I'm ready to, to kind of take the punch in the short run if at least I feel I've done whatever I could do and, and then walk out there. And so I think it leads to a bigger question, though, right? To really work on these underlying uh, self-limiting beliefs also that hold us back a lot of times from having more serenity. It's so interesting, isn't it? It's that kind of, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And and our cognitive bias towards um, being fearful of what we do rather than recognizing the risk in what we don't do 
uh, because nothing is risk free. Yeah, so interesting. And you you talked there about joining the dots and connecting the dots. Talk me through. Well, talk because I've read the book. I, I know this, but <laughs> if you can just um, show us how the serendipity mindset just is about connecting dots and seeing connections and opportunities, and and you know what? Also, I'd love to know a bit more about the history of the title. Why was it changed? Yeah, well, it, it's really you know at the end of the day, when you think about what is underlying, when you think about up to fifty percent of innovations and inventions, when you think about how maybe we met the love of our life and so on. It's never just the moment, the encounter of seeing something, right? It's not just bumping into someone in a coffee shop or it's not just, you know, seeing some unexpected information somewhere um, or so. It's about doing something with that. It's about connecting that to something relevant, to something meaningful. So to give an example, one of the companies that that I've been working with in in China, um, they produce washing machines. And, you know, they received calls from farmers and the farmers told them, your crappy washing machine is always breaking down. And so they asked, well, why is the washing machine breaking down? Well, we're trying to wash our potatoes in it, and it doesn't seem to work. So that is unexpected, right? That's an unexpected trigger that's happening there. What we would usually do is probably say, let's educate the customer. Let's tell them to not wash their potatoes there, that kind of thing, right? But connecting the dots here means, is there something in here that could be meaningful and that could relate to a bigger challenge? For example, that maybe a lot of farmers in China might need to wash their potatoes and they don't have a good device for doing that. And so what this company did was to say, hey, that's unexpected, but why don't we build in a dirt filter and make it a potato washing machine? And that's how unexpectedly so the potato washing machine emerged. That's how, you know, things like Viagra, penicillin, post-it notes emerge because people see something in the moment, but not just see it, they do something with it. They connect the dots to something meaningful. And that's also the reason why, um, you know, for the international paperback you mentioned, um, we kind of adjusted the title from Serendipity Mindset, which was the hardcover title, to um, connect the dots, which is kind of in a way the broader theme of saying okay. at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. It's it's kind of connecting the dots is kind of the approach that helps us to create that kind of smart luck in our life. And it is really, I mean, the statistics are astonishing. I think was it, I'm going to misremember now, was it 40% you said of, of significant inventions have been basically mistakes? Absolutely, up to 50%. I mean, when you think about it, you know, take the example of Viagra, right? Where in a way, people were giving people medication against angina and they realized, oh, my God, you know, there was some kind of <laughs> movement happening, side effect. right? Some kind of movement happening in male participants' trousers. That's embarrassing. <laughs> That's a mistake, right? That shouldn't happen. Oh, my God, let's look away. Like, we, we shouldn't. And, and so on. So that would be our usual reaction, right? To either ignore it or to say, let's, quote, unquote, get rid of this side effect. They did the opposite. They said, you know what? That's unexpected. But probably there are a lot of men in the world who might have a problem in their department. So why don't we make that a medication? That's how unexpectedly so Viagra, but also so many other inventions come about out of these accidents. And I think, Alison, especially at the moment, right, where you see that Mm. breweries turn into hand sanitizer companies because they realize they can't sell the alcohol to restaurants anymore. Things like that, where it's about saying, is there something in that moment that could still be meaningful and where I can connect the dots to something that actually helps me meaningfully in our lives, but also more broadly a company or, or an organization? And I love that phrase, that's unexpected. It, it's almost, you can almost kind of start here and click, 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 can't you? It, it's, uh, when something happens, your your instinct is to say, you know, oh no, that's that's a problem. But yeah, that's unexpected is a much better way of framing it. I love that. And um, you talk as well about a serendipity journal. Just I was really interested in that. Tell me about what, what that means. Absolutely. And, and also just to your point, right? I feel like that rephrasing towards, oh, that's unexpected. We can, we can embed that into you know, our groups, we can embed that into families, into companies, into our own life, where literally we we just reframe it as what surprised me. Oh, it surprised me last week that farmers were washing their potatoes. Huh, maybe there's an opportunity here. And I think what it does, then it reframes the unexpected from just being a threat towards potentially becoming an ally and and something that actually can help us to, uh, to live even more meaningful and, and, and successful life. But, you know, I'm a big fan of, of serendipity journaling, because it's really about saying, how do we step back and reflect a little bit on what is it in my life that led me to serendipity? So what are the occasions in my life where I'm saying serendipity happened usually when I'm in XYZ mood or XYZ situation or XYZ, whatever it is, and then trying to understand what is the pattern behind this? Is there something that 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 I do and can I do more of this? Can I reflect on this? But also really saying when I reflect on the instances where I didn't have serendipity happen, but it could have happened. 
what was it about that? Was there something particular that held me back? Is it the, the imposter syndrome that always comes back and says, hey, you know, you're not ready for this? Then can I work on this? And so the journal is really about st stepping back and saying, what is it about, you know, me that I can learn and that, that I can reflect on, but also more broadly, you know, technically speaking, like thinking about what are the areas in my life that I'm interested in at the moment? What is kind of my North Star or areas of interest that I want to develop? And then taking that and, for example, you know, using particular exercises that, that, that help us to have more serendipity. So, for example, the hook strategy, which is one of my absolute favorites because yeah, it's go so on. easy to use and it's so easy to use in day-to-day -day conversations, right? Where it's really to say, if you use your serendipity journal and you really reflect it on, hey, the key three themes in my life at the moment are I want to learn about the philosophy of science. I want to bring the serendipity mindset into curricula around the world, into companies around the world. And I want to, you know, host piano matinees. These are the kind of three themes in my life, um, hypothetically speaking. And the second one, actually, practically speaking. I was going to um, say the second one sounds very to point. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then really kind of saying, how can I now in every interaction, every conversation, seed a little bit of this? So that, you know, when I come too late to a meeting, I would be like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry I'm late. I was just thinking about how we can bring X, Y, Z into the education system, but now I'm here. And the amount of times people would say, oh, my God, such a coincidence. My aunt is running a school in X, Y, Z. You should connect. It's incredible. And, and I learned that from Oli Barrett, a wonderful entrepreneur in London. If you would ask him that dreaded what do you do question that we all get asked right at every conference and wherever we go, he just he wouldn't just say I'm a technology entrepreneur. He would say I'm a technology entrepreneur recently read into the philosophy of science but what i'm really excited about is playing the piano and then you might be like oh my god such a coincidence we're hosting piano martinez so much i got such a coincidence my sister's teaching on the philosophy of science you name it so the point is that we can then based on this journal really cast these hooks that make it more likely that other people connect the dots for us and i love the way you connected the dots there with the, with the piano and you're beautiful and and what really strikes me about that as well is that that sense well one thing that really strikes me is that this is something i talk to people who are writing a book about a lot so please do not shut yourself in a room and write your book and and then launch it on an unsuspecting world talk about it at every opportunity you get because the the number of people who will say oh that's fascinating you should talk to x or oh perhaps you could come and talk to us you know the opportunities that come up while you write the book are absolutely phenomenal. So I think there is a real instinct for many people, if they're working on something that matters to them, to kind of tamp it down and keep it in because it's so precious and they're scared of people finding out about it and stealing their idea and so on. But actually, the benefits to you of, of putting the things out there and making the connections and getting new opportunities far outweigh that risk, don't they? Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, to, to, to me, it, it's always you know, the fascinating point, and, and I have that, I see that a lot, for example, in my students, right, when they come up with a new business idea, or so their first instinct is to say, oh, I don't want to share it with anyone, because they might steal my idea. And the point always is similar to when you write a book, the idea is 1% of, of, of the thing, right? It's, it's the execution, right? It's really kind it's of all like in the execution, beautiful stories, having beautiful practices, you name it. And that to your point comes from interactions, it comes from a learning curve, it comes from consistently iterating around it and so i'm a big fan actually of thinking about where am i in the cycle of writing for example or in the cycle of my life and then you know am i very open at the moment in this case to serendipity right so for example when i started writing the book i was extremely open to serendipity because i was like look i want more stories i want more insights I, you know i was literally a sponge and then once i was relatively sure about what i wanted to write once i built the networks that could help a little bit also with dissemination and so on i would say okay now let me go, not necessarily to the basement, but like to a coffee shop where kind of like, you know, headphones in and no interaction for a while, just to also be able to focus and execute. Because I think a lot of times we might even get distracted, right, if we have too much input. And so I think it's this beautiful kind of like understanding oneself in that kind of life cycle of writing or life cycle of, of energy. And then when, when am I supposed to write versus when am I supposed to have this? And funny enough, a lot of times then the serendipity happens, right, in, in, even in those focus periods. But um, so that's absolutely... Uh, the case I feel to you know not uh, do the opposite of shutting down and of course the wonderful thing is when you do having absorbed all those inputs you take yourself away and do the writing that process in itself helps helps you connect dots see new patterns new opportunities but yes you're right there's a sort of ebb and flow of of external and internal processes that go on there and it, it isn't it isn't a sequence, is it? It's iterative. It, it you know, you, you get that clear, and then you you move on to the next thing, and and it keeps shaping it. That's a lovely way of looking at it. 
I'm interested in this as a science as well. So, you know, luck has been historically poured over, hasn't it, by, by generals, by politicians. You know, what is luck and, and how can you be prepared for it? What turns it into an academic discipline? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's a very embryonic uh, academic discipline. It's, it's emerging and that's fascinating, right? I remember I, I initially wanted to do part of my PhD on it and, and people would say, oh my God, Christian, you can't do this. Like this would be academic suicide to work on these these topics because, you know, to your point that they've, they've for a long time been seen as esoteric and and slightly, you know, kind of out of space because I think there were all these different um, books, especially that were more about energy and things that, that are a bit tougher maybe to capture um, versus I think the beauty of what's happening at the moment is that we're saying, hey, there are some things that we can learn from different sciences, the natural sciences and the social sciences about how, you know, for example, in molecular chemistry, when you accelerate the you know, amount of, of molecules where you don't know the reaction, but you accelerate how often they meet, you don't know exactly what the unexpected positive outcome would be, but you know that it will be more likely that there will be one, right? And mm -hmm. the same in social interactions. If you bring people together who have similar values, but different ideas, you don't know what the exact outcome will be, but you know that it would be far more likely that some unexpected positive outcome happens. And that's actually where, where part of this, this kind of book idea emerged because, you know, back in the days when, um, so Sandbox Network, a community that I was um, part of setting up, we, uh, you know, you would go to a dinner and people consistently would be like, oh my God, such a coincidence, such a coincidence, such a coincidence, such a coincidence. And the amount of people having coincidences all the time is just fascinating. But again, there's there's some kind of recipe to it in the sense that, you, by definition, can't know what the outcome is, but you can develop uh, intervention points for the process and you can, you know, create more potential serendipity triggers and you can learn how to connect the dots better. And I think that's the science behind it to say, how do we, once we turn serendipity just from a kind of more, you know, spiritual or something that just happens to me to yes. a process that I can influence that is managerially influenceable, then I can actually look at, okay, how do I increase the trigger points? How do I do all these different things? And that's where we can learn a lot from the social sciences, right? How, you know, space design and, and things like that, where it's really about saying, how do we uh, have people interact in ways that create more serendipity? But so the science really coming in and saying, at the end of the day, no one field has really figured it all out, but like by bringing those different fields together, we can literally connect the dots also towards the science of their living. Yeah. And you're right, it's that agency piece as well, isn't it? We think, you know, traditionally we thought of luck as something external. You're either lucky or you're not, or, or that was lucky. And it, it's actually so much more to do with the way that you prepare the ground for it. I mean, I normally, I will in a minute, ask you about um, your best tip for a first time business book writer, but actually I want to ask you for your, for your best tip first about being more lucky how how can we what's the one thing that people can do today to cultivate serendipity in their lives well i'm a big fan of of asking in every situation one is in especially in crisis moments what could still be meaningful in this situation is there still something in here that could present an opportunity to give you an extremely radical example like this is the most radical example one could ever think of but Victor Frankl, who I'm a big fan of, he survived the Holocaust. He, you know, was in the toughest situation you can think of, which is he was in a concentration camp where you most likely will die. There's, there's, there's no objective meaning in this situation. There's nothing meaningful in being in a camp like this. So he said, let me create some meaning in a situation where there objectively is no meaning. So what he would say is, tomorrow I will talk with a fellow prisoner and I will make them feel better. And by doing that, I now have a reason to wake up tomorrow. And then I will do the same again and again and again with other prisoners. And so I am creating myself a meaning here. And I think that's the fascinating thing that a lot of times, you know, in, 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 in situations where inherently there might not be a meaning, we can still find or create socially constructed meaning. So give you an example, you know, um, I, I had COVID last year, uh, a severe uh, form of it and, you know, almost died of it. 911 on speed dial, it was that time in New York, you know, where, um, they, the hospitals were overflowing. You would call the hospital and they would say, if you're not 100% sure it's COVID, don't come in because then COVID will kill you if it's anything else. And, you know, we had hospital tents in Central Park, whatever. It was a very depressing period. And objectively, it felt this is completely meaningless. And emotionally, it felt completely meaningless. And what I found fascinating when looking back is the one thing it did is, and I'm post-rationalizing now that I look back on it, but um, when the one thing it did, though, is 
I, I ask myself a lot of questions around, hey, I'm here now. I've done a lot around purpose and passion and impact, but I'm here alone. And, and I haven't really focused on developing, you know, a, a kind of love relationship that actually I would be here with someone and create a family and, and you name it. And so it opened my mind to the potentiality of saying, hey, I want to be more conscious and look out more for what could it be in my personal life again? Don't don't block mm-hmm. it out and, and be so passion focused. And, you know, during the same time, um, Lexi, who um, now is my wife, uh, went through a very tough divorce. And, and um, you know, we serendipitously re-met after a, a lot of years. And one thing led to another. We have now a two-month-year-old beautiful baby that's crying <laughs> in the room next door. Uh, and, 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 and things came together. And again, the reason I'm saying this is that inherently back in that day with the COVID almost killing me, like there was no meaning whatsoever. But when I think back now, it was an inflection point mm-hmm. saying I opened my mind to that person and there's much more to the story, but that that person actually could not only be a good friend as she was before, but I opened my mind that could actually be someone I could be in a relationship with. And, and, and I think because I looked at people differently, I literally looked at people and said, could I picture that person could in a relationship or not? Da, da, da. And so I feel like that reframing of like really thinking about, okay, I want to prioritize this made it then more likely, right, that that would happen and likely on uh, her side as well. She made most of that happen uh, on, on, on her side. But uh, long story You've had short, quite an 18 months, haven't you? I'm sorry? <laughs> You've had quite the 18 months. Oh, indeed, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> it was fast. What an amazing story uh, it, re- and really powerful. Thank you for, sh- for sharing that. But again, it's that it takes me back to what you said before about that's unexpected. Those, those little, because in the moment, it's hard to do that mental gymnastics, isn't it? To, to find, you know, to, to find the opportunity to think about it differently. But if you have a go-to phrase, like, what can I see in here that's an opportunity? That's unexpected. If that becomes a kind of little program that you play in your mind, it becomes much easier to notice what's happening and default to that. It's sort of training your brain, isn't it? Exactly. And I think then, you know, if you really think about what could I connect this to? Is there something in my life that I can connect this to? Then we become better at connecting dots. And then yeah. every interaction becomes more likely to, oh, my God, hey, such a coincidence. I can introduce you to this person. And then we start connecting the dots and, and see opportunity everywhere. And, you know, I'm going to steal that shamelessly as a, as a prompt, I think, because we, we, I do a weekly um, sort of facilitated writing sprint, six minute sprint. And I'm always on the lookout for good prompts for that. But I think that, that you know, something that's happening that's that's annoying or, or irritating or, or, or negative. What can I connect this to? Or in fact, anything really. It's a great prompt to yourself, isn't it? To, to really kind of think onto paper and, and work out what you can take away from it. Love it. And now I'm going to do the thing that I said I was going to do and ask you for your, for your best tip for a first time business book writer. And obviously you've come sort of from academia, so you've got a good pedigree in writing and that has its own problems when you come to write a business book. But for somebody who's doing this for the first time, what would you say to them? Yeah, it's interesting because a lot of people around me, um, you know, are embarking on books. And I feel when I try to understand, you know, what differentiates those that go through with a book versus those that don't, I feel a lot of times it's really the writing routine and really the idea of mm. that someone is able to say, let me understand when I have peak energy for writing, because I can spend five hours on a Word document and get nothing done when I'm kind of low energy, or I can spend half an hour peak energy and get five pages done. And so it's really, um, the one is kind of the reflective piece around saying, how do I manage my energy? And when do I know that I have peak energy? And can I can I protect that kind of one or two hours per day, being it in the morning for some and in the evening for others, and make that a routine every day, over and over and over again? And that literally fills the pages, right? Like being peak mm-hmm. hour writing, even short periods, um, even if we don't have a lot of control over our time. So I think that that's a lot, um, um, that kind of piece around managing energy, but then also relating that to developing some kind of routine around writing. Yeah. And protecting that time. I like that phrase you used because it's so easy, isn't it? To just let that time be taken up by other people's agendas. Yeah. It's super practical. And, and also I think it's a reminder because quite often we listen to the advice of people who write and we say, oh, this is what they did. So I'm going to copy that. And actually if they're a morning person and you're not, it ain't going to work. You really have got to be aware of and, and play with what works and notice and reflect on that and, and uh, yeah, build your own routine. Brilliant. And I'm going to ask you too, as I always do for all my guests, to recommend, I, I say a business book, frankly, Christian, it could be any book you like that you think would be of interest and value to the people listening to the podcast. What would you recommend? 
it's probably Viktor Frankl's man's search for meaning because, mm -hmm. you know, what is business in the end? At the end of the day, it's all about people. It's all about understanding oneself and, and others. And I think Viktor Frankl, you know, he wrote that book, Man's Search for Meaning, really trying to understand how do you find meaning and how do you identify meaning and, and how do you make every situation meaningful? And I think especially for leaders, that's a key leadership skill, right? To figure out how do I create meaning in any kind of situation for people around myself and, 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 and for me. So highly recommended Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. It's decades old, but, uh, you know, still delivers. Well, it's decades old um, and it's you're right. It's an absolutely brilliant book. But I, I was thinking about this the other day and his that point that you have, even when there seems to be absolutely no freedom for you and no options, you have a choice in how you respond. And, and that is your freedom. And I think, you know, with, with COVID and uh, with all the uncertainty uh, and all the external stuff that's that's happening to us at the moment, that that is such a great reminder. It feels very timely. Yeah, great recommendation. Thank you. And Christian, if people want to find out more about you, more about Connect the Dots, where should they go? Yeah, well, uh, the homepage is serendipitymindset.com um, or I'm on Twitter at Chris Serendip and then on the Penguin page, the Connect the Dots book can be found. Fantastic. And I will put all those links up on the show notes at extraordinarybusinessbooks.com. And thank you for your time today. I, you know, I really enjoyed reading the book and it, it made me much more... Um, and I don't know, cheerful about possibilities. And I think, you know, that's a real gift that you can give people as a writer is to make them see possibilities, to make them feel more agency in their lives. So thank you for that. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.